Hey folks, in lesson 12, we've now started chapter 4 in the Kasdan and Paley book. And what we're going to start doing now is we're going to start applying F equals MA in some unique ways. So our first is going to be linear momentum and impulse. We'll do angular momentum and impulse. And then in the next chapter, we'll start looking at energy. But the main thing you need to consider here is that these are simply just alternative forms of Newton's second law. We're going to use Newton's second law to get everywhere that we're going to go for the rest of this, uh, for the rest of the class, really. And so, chapter three was really the foundational chapter of the entire book. All right, so let's get started on linear momentum and linear impulse. So here you see F equals m a in the form that we discussed. I believe it was back in chapter two. And, and really, this mirrors Newton's language, in which he said, you know, we get this motive force, and it's equal to this time differentiation of the momentum. And so this is linear momentum of point P with respect to O, where O is inertially fixed. And that's defined as the mass multiplied times the inertial velocity of point P, as observed in, that, as observed in the inertial reference frame. So let's move our dt onto the side of our force and this is going to be equal to d of our mass multiplied times the velocity of p as observed in the inertial reference frame and so we integrate both sides from time one to time two and so this gives us the form of the integral of time one to time two of our force dt is equal to our mass multiplied times our velocity of p as observed in the inertial reference frame at time two minus the mass multiplied times the velocity of point p in the inertial reference frame at time one so it's the change in momentum is equal to the integral of the force across time. So the more common form that we can rearrange this, the more common form to use is that the velocity of point P, observe the inertial reference frame, at time two is going to be equal to the momentum at time one plus the impulse, or not, not the impulse rather, but the integrate the integral of our force of point P integrated across time. And so what we're saying is that the change in linear momentum is equal to the integral of the force. Now, a couple things to point out here is that this term for the force, remember our, our force is oftentimes a, a messy term. It's often dependent upon the state of the system. And, and it makes that equation difficult to, really difficult to solve. And so we still have, uh, we haven't, even though this looks at like a somewhat simpler form than what we've used with our second order differential equations, when force is dependent upon the state, we still have a differential equation. And so it is a little bit messy. Um, the other thing that, to point out here is that the units are in Newton seconds. Okay, which is could be kind of a strange way to look at this, or a strange um, series of units that you that you may not have seen before. But they are in newton seconds, so keep that in mind. Remember, you can always check your units, um, or that's a great way to check your answers to your problems is just checking your units as a start. All right, so I mentioned that if force is a function of the state of the system, it's probably better just to leave this in F equals MA form, solve for your second order differential equation, and then solve that either analytically if you can, or numerically um, if you can't, and be able to gain the state of the system from that. However, there are three situations where this format is very helpful to use. And so, as I mentioned at the beginning, these alternative forms of F equals MA, they have their situations, and it's it becomes a matter of recognizing when is appropriate to apply these. So the first of these situations is when the force that we're integrating is equal to zero. And so that seems like a trivial 
concept. However, what that's just saying is that we have conservation of linear momentum. And this is representative of Newton's first law, which says that when an, when an object is in motion, that it's not going to change its, its speed or it's not going to change its path unless acted on by an outside force. The second of these is where we know what the time or what the force is as a function of time. And that could mean that the force is constant, not zero, or it could mean that or it could mean that we actually know that force. Maybe we've measured it with a load cell or some other instrument. And so when we know that, this expression here is very easy to implement because we can just integrate force over time. If we know that force across time, then we've got all the information that we need. And finally, we have the case where this time interval, t1 to t2, or delta t, is incredibly small. And this is where we're going to see the application of linear momentum most often. And so what we have here is what we call an impulse, or an impulsive force. And so an impulsive force is going to be a force that has a a somewhat high magnitude, and this is a you know kind of a rough qualitative term, over a very, very small time period. And so in these plots that I just took from the book, what we have here is, is an a view of what that impulse looks like and then if you expand that we see that the impulse itself is is going to have some sort of smooth shape to it in which you can take the integral of. Now two very important things that come from an impulsive force is that when you apply this force across a very small time period what we're changing is linear momentum. Now linear momentum is going to be mass times the velocity Okay. And remember that velocity is a vector. So because velocity is a vector, it has both a direction and it also has a magnitude. So in this frame B, what you see is how it can change direction. If you apply a force over a small period of time and it's not in the direction of motion that it's already that a, the point is already traveling, then you're going to change the direction and in fact, example 4.2 from the book, where it's talking about these two fish that are swimming synchronously, is an ex excellent example of an impulsive force that's changing the direction of the system. And then finally, what we have here in this panel B is that if you're in the same direction, then you can change the speed, and you change the speed instantly. And that concept is really important because now this gives us a tool in which we can apply which we can apply initial conditions and it's initial an initial condition of speed. So for example, we've talked before about you know this simple pendulum. Okay. And every time that we've talked or you know solved simple pendulums or solved any, any of our problems, what we've done is we've essentially like pulled the pendulum back, you know, to a particular point and then we let it go and then it'll oscillate back and forth. And so this is a position initial condition you know, where we say theta at time zero has some angle, let's say 45 degrees. Okay? But so far we haven't done anything where we've given it an initial speed you know, and, and perhaps that's 20 degrees per second. Okay, or 20 radians per second. And so by having an impulse, this allows us the tools to be able to do this. Now, instinctively, if you were you know, given a physical system of a, of, a, of a system and you were going to start at theta is equal to zero, what you would probably do if you wanted to give it an initial velocity is you'd probably flick it with your finger. And, well, interestingly, that's exactly what an impulse is. Now, I should also say that an impulse of force, we write that a particular way and we, we write it this way. We're going to put a hat on top of it and so it's, it's F and it is a vector so we put an underline on the, on the point P and then in our parentheses we do time 1 comma time 2 you know, showing that it's a very very small time and that's equal to our force on P dt from time 1 to time 2. So whenever you see this notation, f with, a, f with a hat on it, f with a line over top of it, and these times, this is saying that we have an impulsive force that's causing an instant change in momentum.
Let's apply this idea of an impulsive force, which we said is a force, a large force acting over a small time period, to an oscillatory system or a harmonic system, these systems that we've seen before, to get this idea of what an, an impulse response is and how this is useful in dynamic systems. So what we have here is we have our, our mass and our spring, no damper in this quite yet, and we're we have a system that we know is going to oscillate back and forth. And when we solved this before, we made a, a convenient substitution in which we changed our coordinates. And so let's do that again. We'll change our coordinates to the z coordinates, where that's equal to our position in the x direction minus the resting state of the spring. And so essentially all that's going to be doing is just starting our new our coordinate system from here and saying that positive z as a function of time is going to start where the mass is while resting. And when we say resting, we're talking about the equilibrium point, which, we've, which we have introduced before. And so if there's no initial conditions applied to this system, it's simply going to sit still. It's not going to oscillate um, or do anything else. We worked out the solution for this system which is z is equal to the initial position multiplied times cosine over mega naught t plus z dot or initial our initial speed divided by our omega naught which is our natural frequency sine omega naught t and so this is where that omega naught or that natural frequency is defined as the square root of k divided by the mass, k being the spring constant. And so let's apply an initial speed to this system um, and have it start at an initial position of z is equal to zero. And so to do that, we are going to apply an impulsive force. So let's draw our impulsive force. Let's and let's apply the impulsive force backward or in the negative e1 direction and so that's f with a bar over top t1 comma t2 so first let's write out that, that relationship of impulse and momentum which says that the mass z dot at t2 and this is in the e one direction is equal to the mass of point P, z dot t1 in the e1 direction. And then our impulse is in the negative e1 direction. So it's minus f bar t1 t2 in the e1 direction. All right, so the mass is at rest at time one, right? So what we're doing is we're applying this force that's over a small increment of time. And so time one is going to be when the mass is at rest. At time two, we want to have an initial speed going to the left, but still no change in position. Okay, that's this definition of, of impulse. So if the mass is at rest at time one, then z dot at time one is equal to zero. And so we can solve for the speed at the end of the impulse, which is z dot at time 2, that's at the end of the impulse but before the system has begun moving, is equal to negative, and that's our impulse on t, our magnitude of our impulse, divided by the mass p. And so we've effectively given the system this initial speed without changing its position, okay? Because our other initial condition is z0 is equal to zero. And so let's substitute all that in. And so let's just pull our solution down here that we've solved for before because we get z at time zero cosine omega naught t plus we substitute in our impulse t1 t2 divided by our mass 
multiplied times the natural frequency sine or natural frequency times t. And so this term, because we're starting at a position 0, is equal to 0. And so our solution is quite simple, where we have our solution for position is going to be our impulse time 1 time 2 divided by the mass times the natural frequency of sine omega naught t. And so if we plot our solution that has an initial speed and not an initial position, our mathematics are telling us that we have a sine function in which our magnitude is equal to the magnitude of the impulse d1, t2 divided by the mass multiplied times natural frequency. And so that's going to be the magnitude there as well as this magnitude will be the negative t1, t2 divided by our mass natural frequency. Now beforehand when we had an initial position but not an initial velocity we didn't have a sine function but instead we would start at a particular position and then we would oscillate at the same frequency. And so the differences in these two systems are that in red we see what would be called the position response and in green we have the impulse response. And an impulse response is an important concept because you're going to see this in future courses. You'll see this in any signals type courses that you have. You'll see this in controls, in system dynamics, um, in which we'll do quite a bit of controls. But an impulse response is typically the test signal that's given to any type of system that has time varying dynamics because an impulse response, if you recall what that plot looked like, okay, an impulse response typically defined is where the integration is equal to zero. Or, I'm sorry, the integration of the force is equal to one. And then that tells us, in this case, that it's composed of every single frequency that exists. So you're exciting the system with all frequencies, and then you're getting what that system gives back to you. Okay. Now this isn't a major theme in this class, but knowing what an impulse is and, and what an impulse response is, uh, is important. But necessarily how to interpret um, exactly everything that comes out of it isn't. That said, um, this is sort of trivial actually, where we just apply this to uh, just a spring mass system. But it becomes less trivial when we apply this to a spring mass damper system. So let's look at our system up top and let's apply that, apply to this, a damper. Okay. Now remember when we put in this damper, we've solved for this before that we have a particular solution to this system. And so here's the solution for an underdamped system. And recall that an underdamped system is where we have our damping coefficient is less than 1. And so we, we solve for this. We said that um, it's, it has an, uh, an exponent, a negative exponent, so it's a decaying exponential. And then we have a similar looking cosine that's attached to our initial position, as well as a sine that's attached to um, what's our initial speed with some other parameters in here with the damping coefficient. And this is where the damped natural frequency is equal to the natural frequency scaled by this term, 1 minus zeta squared. Now when we've plotted this before, we've always had a position response, and so you know that would have been some initial position and then 
we give it some we let it go and then it's going to continue to oscillate and then in this case with an impulse response so you can recognize the difference between an impulse response and a position response our position response is going to start at zero and then it's going to increase and then eventually have the the same the same response um, that that continues for the remainder of your of your simulation okay so what we've done is we've taken f equals ma and we took it in its its kind of primitive form saying that the change in linear momentum is equal to the forces on the system and we've developed this expression in which we talk about this specifically the change in linear momentum between time one to time two is equivalent to this integration of the force and then this third this third condition in which time one to time two is extremely small we have an impulsive force and that's typically where we're going to use this so if you can recognize problems and here's what you want to look for recognize problems that are are given to you in terms of velocity you need to you need to change either the direction something is traveling or the speed in which it's traveling and you can do that by applying a a force over a small time period and then this form becomes very handy to use. Alright, I'll see you in class.